sermon text will be Philippians 1, 21 through 27. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But I, if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I know not. For I am in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is the more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. And your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only your, your conversation be as it become, becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, and may, I may hear of your affairs that ye, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Our focus text this morning is this 27th verse, what we call the 27th verse, where Paul is writing to these believers to whom he and uh, Silas and Timothy uh, delivered the gospel during what we call the second journey across the Roman Empire after hearing or seeing a vision, vision of the man from Macedonia, come over and help us. Well, it was obvious what kind of help was being asked for. It wasn't for clothing or food or shelter. It wasn't for political guidance, uh, any kind of a economic or social counsel. This was of God. They knew that it was. When they saw it, God had guided them. The, the, the Lord Jesus himself by his spirit had guided them through Asia. They started to travel to the north and he said no. They started to travel to the south and he said no. They continued to travel to the west until they, got, until they arrived in Troas where Brother Luke joined them because the pronouns in his record there changed from they to we. So Luke is a witness of these things. He was there as well. And they had that, uh, Paul received that vision and they arrived there in Philippi as they were requested and they found godly women. Think of that. This was their first association according to the record. Godly women meeting by the river. Uh, there was not a quorum, if you will, of male Jews for them to have a synagogue there in Philippi. But these women joined together, gathered together there in that place and they were found of the brethren. And they found the brethren. <laughs> they found this, these uh, carriers of this message. And God opened Lydia's heart to believe. She and her household were baptized and that house that appears became a focal point of the work there in the city of Philippi. And the work continued there. Uh, we don't know for precisely how long until the incident of the casting out of the demon of the young woman who followed them through the streets for many days, it says. For many days this occurred until Paul stopped the advertising. He wasn't going to have a word from the mouth of a demon interfere with the work and the message that they were doing. And so after their imprisonment and the earthquake, the jailer's conversion, see God worked even in that. It didn't matter about the demands of wealthy, powerful people and the loss of their income through this young woman. God worked through that, didn't interfere with anything he was doing. And then of course, after they strengthened the brethren, there in that place, they departed to preach in other places. Now, Brother Paul's words demonstrate in himself these words written from uh, possibly from Corinth, maybe earlier, as they uh, remained there and continued in the work. He wrote back and sent back this letter to the brethren there in Philippi. And it appears from the record that, that, that these brethren uh, joined with them in, uh, in uh, supporting their work in other places. So these were significant brethren. These, these, these were serious brethren there in Philippi. They were interested in continuing in the work in uh, wherever it was. Not, they, were, they were not focused just on themselves and just what are we going to get from it and just how are we going to benefit from this. No, 
They were interested in the truth of God being sent out to others as it was delivered to them. And Brother Paul, of course, knew that they needed to be continued to minister to and provided for. They needed to continue to be shepherded. That's why he says these words about, uh, I know that it's important for me to continue here, even though it'd be better to go be with the Lord. <laughs> I'm going to continue with you. Uh, I apologize. I forgot that, that Brother Paul wrote this letter from the city of Rome. I'm getting ahead of myself, getting some things confused. He wrote from the city of Rome years, years later. It's been years since he had seen them. And they had sent, uh, they had sent gifts to him again and again, providing for him. So his words here provide that when he was with them, uh, pro uh, provide for them even as when he was with them in the beginning, introducing them to the grace and faith that are in Christ Jesus. He is now exhorting them to increase, to make progress in these things that were once for all delivered to them. And he does these words, and he does so with these words of our focus text. Only he begins. Notice that, that's a word of focus. That's a word of emphasis. That's a word to press in. Don't, don't lose sight of this. Keep, keep your eyes fixed on this only, only. Let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Their attention and their affection was to be fixed, continue to be fixed on that truth as, as, a, as a Brother Matt has so ably uh, challenged us and exhorted us. You remember that uh, what in the gospel, what first grabs our attention, as Brother Matt said, is this burden of sin, the wrath of God. When uh, Israel came out of Egypt, 40 years later, Rahab was still speaking about the wrath of God in Egypt, wasn't she? In fact, some 300 years after that, when the Philistines captured the ark and the, and, and the, uh, the uh, hemorrhoid and rat plague came down upon them, what were they talking about? Well, this is the God that destroyed the Egyptians. That was 300 years earlier. They're still talking about that. See, the wrath of God fixes men's attention. And so they returned that ark. And when the gospel is preached, this message of the cross, it highlights God's wrath towards sin because that's what was happening in the cross. God was expending his wrath even on his own, his beloved, his only begotten. When he became sin on the cross, when he bore human sin in his body on the tree, he was cursed of God. Now that, that fixes the attention of the tender heart. This is serious business. This is weighty. This has gravitas, as some have said in the past. This, this is something you better give your attention to. It draws the attention of God. And once it does, then, fixes our attention, then the truth can be communicated to us. More truth, because that's, that's not the end of the story at all. That's just the introduction, so to speak. The truth can be sent into the heart and the mind where it can take root and grow into understanding then of God's ways and God's works and God's words. The cross of Christ imposes attention. It imposes attention on the tender heart and mind. It is the central aspect of God's truth. His wrath displayed upon his only begotten son and yet he recovered. He recovered because he was able. He was able to bear this burden. None other was able to do so. But he was able to carry it away, to take it away, and come back again by the sacrifice of himself, the suffering of his soul. This was the message that the apostles preached, that these things had been accomplished by God as he had promised. These women that were gathered there by the river, you see, they believed the things that God had made known. They didn't understand them all, but they believed the things that God had made known in the prophets, in the Psalms, and the prophets, and Moses in the past. That's what had drawn them there together. They valued and appreciated the scripture message. And so the apostles were able to just come and say, God has accomplished what he said he would accomplish. That was what they said. That's what they had preached there in the synagogue in Antioch in, in uh, Brother Luke's, uh, what we call the 13th chapter of this record. So the hearer's attention is set 
on these things and then the gospel introduces the mercy and the kindness and the wisdom of God to bring us to himself again. This, this fixes then man's affection. Those who believe the affection and gratitude are fixed upon God. Believers can see the advantage that God has delivered to us, Amen. that he has afforded us in his grace and his truth that is in Christ Jesus. The, the wrath and the grace of God in the same person. The wrath was temporary. The grace unending. It was always there. Amen. It was always there. It was even there as he passed through this time and came back again, of course. And so he was, uh, we have all received then, haven't we? Brother John says, we have all received of his grace, grace for grace. His wrath was temporary, his grace the dominating aspect of God's nature, both abundant and full in his son Christ Jesus. Now once Brother Paul saw this, of course he knew the things that had been written by Moses, the things that had been declared by Brother David, the things that Isaiah and Ezekiel spoke about, Jeremiah spoke about, this new covenant that God would establish. He, he knew those words. <laughs> he didn't know the reality of it until he heard these things, until he, until he met the Savior on the road there. Then, when he personally recognized these things, he determined what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. His laser-like fervor came to the fore with great power when he said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that's what worked in him. And so he's exhorting these readers. Listen to what he says here in chapter 3. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if anything be, uh, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this unto you also. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. See how that provokes and stirs up the faithful heart. Now that we're agreed with the truth and alert in the truth, our hearts and our minds are renewed by the grace of God, Paul could direct, Paul could direct them with this exhortation, with these promises, be careful for nothing, he says. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren... These words are from close to the end of the letter. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. See how he's directing their minds and their hearts in increasing and, 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 and uh, uh, yielding themselves to the enlargement of these things that God has made known to them. Such words can only be said to those who are renewed in the spirit of their minds. And the faith that God endues us, by which God endues us with power, the Holy Spirit and His working of His Word, as, it, it, as, as obstacles are removed in the working of God in us. And we are then equipped as believers to walk in this faith. And the fellowship that we have of God in Christ Jesus enables us in, with, with, with uh, one accord and awareness of God's working in heart, this happens. This continuing work proceeds in the hearts of those who are delivered, who are brought to this faith that was once for all delivered to the saints through Christ Jesus and by the Holy Spirit. And then he talks about a certain conduct and behavior. Stand fast in one spirit your conduct, becoming of the gospel. Stand fast in one spirit. Remain in these things and do so as fellow believers, a union, one with another. Those who share these things, workers in the gospel, where in the body where God has set us. This un and this union transcends family and physical locations. That was evident by, by uh, the, the Philippians and their fellowship with the apostles and his associates through the, through the years up to this point. And he's, and from, from the time he had first preached to them till the time he wrote this letter to them from the state of Rome at the end of the book of Acts. So this union transcends those things. We stand in truth. We walk in it. At the same time, God's Spirit works in us to do so. That is, of course, unless one quenches him. 
and so grieves him. Well, that's what Brother Paul's guarding against in these believers. He doesn't want that to happen. And what they, God's Spirit works in us to do these things, working in and among us in the body. It's the point of these words, see, in their, in their association with one another. He's writing to the whole body here. This is not a letter to an individual. This is to all of them, to hear together, to think on together. The point of these words, your association with other believers. And so the brother exhorts them with these words, and this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and all judgment that ye may approve the things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. Now this involves judgment, doesn't it? This involves some decision making. It involves insight and understanding perception of the things, of the purpose of God, the working of God, in all of us together. All of us together, see, standing fast in one spirit, in fact, he closes this letter with these words, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. In one mind striving together, he talks about like-mindedness. Now, this will be tested. This like-mindedness among the brethren, this will be tested. All of us have had this, had this testing at one point or another down through the years. This like-mindedness among the body, which comes from faith, that God delivers to us, and the love of the truth, and the hope of glory. See, all of that together fixes the minds of the believers together. These things are delivered to us, of course. They're not something we generate and provoke and stir up and manufacture and produce ourselves. They're delivered to us in this gospel as some might call it a, a, a package deal. Well, we don't generate it, of course. We cannot comprise these things. They come only from God and Christ by the Holy Spirit. This work of faith maintains these things in us. Faith, hope, and love shared among the believers. The words and the deeds of truth working in us. It's the obedience to and of faith and the work of faith that's abiding in our heart. And we in it together, one with another. So once again, Brother Paul exhorts them in the central part of this letter. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, you know those are all rhetorical questions, we know the answer to those questions. You don't have to search. If you have to search and wonder, <laughs> then you need to rethink some things. And your faith needs to be stronger. See, If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man to his own things, but every man also to the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now some may wonder about some of the conflict in the churches. If this is the way it's to be, why did Brother Paul have to deal with conflict? Why did he have to give warnings? Like, when I come, we'll find out who's got power. Remember where he said that about to the Corinthians? We'll find out who's got power. Shall I come with a rod, he says. Well, now, is there some kind of contradiction here? No, there's not. <laughs> no, there's not. Because, you see, he was standing in his love of the truth, in his faith of the truth first. The people were not primary. We're not primary in this issue. The truth is primary. The truth has been made known of God who is the God of truth and His Son Christ Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we've received a love of the truth. So our devotion to Him is first and foremost. Amen. We're not just taking care of each other Amen. and our emotional, physical, and whatever kinds of needs uh, people think that the church is, a, is a, uh, some kind of social uh, organization just to take care of people. Not so. Not so. The truth and the faith of God has been entrusted to us for us to remain faithful to it. And this is why Brother Paul's writing, only, he says, only this. Now all of these things will follow, see. all these, And they will follow in us together. They'll work in all of us together. Some will lead. Some have certain positions and places in the, in the body that are more public more prominent, you might say, but 
we all know, as Brother Paul says there in his letter to the church in Corinth, which parts of the body are the more important ones? The ones that are seen or the ones that are not seen? Yeah. Yeah. So again, as we are faithful and love the truth, these things will increase in us. We will see these things in one another. They will be demonstrated in us. If they're not demonstrated, then something's wrong way back, way back here somewhere. <laughs> it's not just a matter of correcting behavior and conduct. It's a matter of correcting the heart and the thinking and the perception of the truth. Because God works these things in those who believe. And they will be a witness of and, 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 and will be uh, and will demonstrate these things in themselves. That's what he's talking about. I, when I hear of your affairs, see, he wanted to hear of, of these things, the progress and the increase of these good things. He wanted to hear of a personal demonstration of the truth in each of them. It's part and parcel, if we want to say it that way, of the truth which we love, which believers love. And it's the natural course of the life into which we have been called and set, our feet set in that way. So we have, pardon me, so we have these following words, again, from the central part of this letter. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. See how these thoughts fit together? They're joined together in this working of God in his people, their hearts uh, attuned to the truth their hearts then attuned to one another. And uh, of course there, there's going to be trouble. There'll be attempts by the enemy to come in. There'll be stumblings and failings by us. Peter and Paul had that, didn't they? There had to be some correction from time to time. But they responded quickly. They were serious. They were sober about these things. And so even though there was some difficulty and trouble, they quickly recovered. When it was pointed out to them, when these things were highlighted, they quickly recovered. And they contrasted their uh, behavior with that of the world and with that of their own behavior in the past. There was a contrast. There was a difference. Everyone could see it. And they were not ashamed of these things. The faith of God in Christ Jesus will produce these things as we are delivered from worldly lust and corruption and the, the uh, worldly lust and passions and the corruptions that bring destruct destruction. We are seated then in the classroom of God's grace, and it teaches us these things. We cut off the things that, are, uh, that corrupt us. We cut off the things that God refuses and will not receive, and we put on this sober, godly, and righteous heart and mind in this present age. It begins here. It contrasts with our past in the course of this world. We live in it where we still live, but of course we're not a part of it any longer. So now one further exhortation. And one that warns, warns. Now, the believers there in Philippi had seen these things. When uh, Paul and Silas and Timothy were there, Luke, and they'd seen, they, they'd seen this uh, conflict. They'd seen this violence erupt. Many walk, of whom I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. Now we know that when that Paul, Paul's reference here is to false teachers, primarily. The particular demonstration that the believers there in Philippi had seen were the businessmen who were upset about the casting out of the demon. Now they're being warned about a more subtle danger. Some who have come in among them, trying to draw them away. Someone, some who have come in to spy out their liberty and want to draw them back into some kind of religious bondage. Now the businessmen that complained there in chapter, Acts chapter 16 about the casting out of the demon, they were not concerned about any religion. They were only concerned about their bank accounts. This is much more subtle. 
And the believers need to be warned. They need to stand, and it, and it may be violent. It may be very unsettling. It may be ugly in some sense, and some people will not tolerate such a thing. But it must be. It must be dealt with. The believers need to understand. It's going to impact everything that they have, everything that they are in Christ Jesus, unless their faith is fixed on Him. Their focus is firm. It will, it will impact their behavior. It will impact their conduct. Sooner or later, it will. Some are enemies of the cross of Christ. So a final exhortation. Then as Brother Paul closes this letter, he says to them, let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, Brother Paul, of course, he doesn't mean don't get too excited now and don't get too overwrought. He doesn't mean that at all. <laughs> He's talking about consistency and stability here. Continue in the things that you've heard and believed, as he said in other letters. Don't give up. Don't turn back. As we've already said this morning, the opening, very able opening of our, of our thoughts and our meeting this morning, these things increase, these things multiply, they increase and multiply us, both us individually and us as a body and us as numbers are added to, as the Lord adds to us. Amen. Brethren, the faith of the gospel these products of a believing heart and mind. Such is God's power unto salvation, producing and working in us that which is pleasing in His sight and effective for His name's sake and effective for us as well. These qualities and characteristics of godliness built into the nature of these things that we have heard and that we believe. He produces them in us. Faith empowers us to do to be and to do according to the will of God. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Such is the exhortation to every believing heart by our trust in the gospel of Christ Jesus in whom we have believed and for whom we wait from heaven. Thank you, brethren. God's grace and peace.